Hello to everybody, Vladimir Bulgarian Cowboy Vlad, and we're now discussing which martial art is the best for MMA bout, for MMA battle. And Vladimir the Bulgarian Cowboy Vlad is now trying to intrigue you into this world, trying to, you know, discuss a bit on this lovely topic. And we're now going to see what are just my expectations about the martial arts and so on. So it's kind of harsh to start because there are so many lovely, great martial arts in the world of mixed martial arts. Because, you know, like Ido Pariente said in one interview with me, submissions are like children. So, yeah, I agree with him. Martial arts are like children because I love all of them. Despite I'm generally, by nature, I'm a striker, but I love all of them. All martial arts are great at its own way. It's kind of a very, very hard decision to choose the best one. So I'll talk now a bit on advantages, disadvantages, and various stuff that's around. That's around this, let's say, difficult territory that's around everything around, everything around this highly, highly huge controversy. Now let's start talking about martial arts, kickboxing. Kickboxing is generally good. I mean, it generally one, let's say, of the most complete striking martial arts. Because striking is very, very much important in the world uh, of uh, MMA. I pretty much like striking. Kickboxing gives you many advantages. The first good advantage of kickboxing is the ability to connect uh, punches, kicks, and knees. The ability to change levels, which can be pretty much good in uh, in MMA combat because uh, many fighters many fighters hardly defend punches and kicks at the same time because when you focus on your head you know you have to cover up but it leaves midsection open it leaves uh, your legs open it's kind of harsh to block the head and after that immediately to check a kick it's a very, very difficult topic. It's a very, very, pretty much a nightmare, you know. In kickboxing, the majority of the points is achieved through a low kick and through a kick to the knee, through a kick to the legs. And it's one of the reasons why a good uh, kickboxing topic uh, is always negotiable. Good kickboxer can keep the opponent on distance he can knee him, but it depends whether he is a Dutch or American kickboxer. For example, Alistair Overeem is an example of a perfect kickboxer in the world uh, of uh, mixed martial arts because uh, good kickboxing is always appreciated when you meet a stand-up opponent, when you meet a stand-up striker. For example, Alistair he has good rest and clinch, which is kind of his trademark, but on the other hand... Uh, Alistair over him, he has uh, one uh, big advantage, and uh, his greatest advantage is uh, the ability to keep the opponent on a distance with his straight punches, the ability to kick hard. Let's look back at his uh, fight against Brock Lesnar at UFC 141. Looking back on that, I think uh, Alistair over him pretty much kicked Brock Lesnar's ass because Brock Lesnar was trying to wrestle, but Alistair was constantly keeping him away with the very, very difficult punches, the very, very strong blows, and he was unable to let him remain on distance. This is one of the ultimate reasons, one of the ultimate reasons why, why Alistair Overeem is one of the best kickboxers ever, because he couldn't, he is not going to let the opponent get close to him. He can hold him away with a good range of kicks, with a good low kicks, with a good high kicks, with good punches, and especially with amazing knees of the clinch. In MMA, you've got to know an MMA kickboxing. I mean, a regular kickboxing, it's how to say, a regular kickboxing is kind of different because uh, striking is allowed, but you mustn't grab the leg. You mustn't hold the leg. You mustn't push the opponent to the ground. This is the reason why kickboxing is one of the best striking martial arts, but you've got to modify it. You really have to modify it. Now let's transition to Maltai. 
I am a big fan of Mao Tai for numerous reasons. For example, I like Mao Tai because uh, it's the science of eight limbs, and I'm writing for one for one boss at the moment who asks for kickboxing and Mao Tai topics. I write a lot about Mao Tai, and I'm pretty much sure this martial art has everything. It has Mao Tai clinch. It has sweeps. It has elbows. It has knees. It has punches. It has kicks, and it also has the ability to learn the fighter to go forward and fight until the last bell, which is very, very positive feature. Very much many fighters are happy because of that, because uh, when a fighter sees the opportunity to use everything he has, this kind of becomes better. It kind of becomes... Uh, a lot, lot uh, more interesting in fighting because the opponent has uh, fewer options. The opponent doesn't have that much options left against a good uh, Mao Tai fighter because a Mao Tai fighter simply knows everything. Let's look back at Carlos Condit. Carlos Condit throws spinning back elbow, spinning back fist, knees of the clinch, kicks of the distance. The guy has everything. All right. Carlos Condit, he's not in his prime, I've got to tell you. All right, he's not in his prime, I mean, you can't change that. It's the unfortunate set of the events, because Carlos Condit is uh, really one of the most powerful guys in the UFC, but he's on cold streak right now, and I think he's going to get his contract. I don't think he will be able to keep his contract, because he is losing. He lost many times in a row, and I highly doubt Dana White is going to tolerate this because he has zero empathy on the other side. Mao Tai guy, like Wanderlei Silva, for example, the ex-murderer, he knew a Mao Tai clinch. Hey, Kendall, how's everything going? Yeah, I respected the word uh, on 3rd January. I was also on first. Thank you for being here. About Wanderlei Silva, he has the strong knees. You know the way he KO'd Quinton Rampage Jackson. One of the most powerful knockouts. He was the ex-murderer. I mean, he still is, but he's not in the prime. But he's the first guy who actually brought Mao Tai into the world. I mean, if there is other guys, I don't know. But before Wanderlei Silva, there wasn't uh, much attention towards Mao Tai and its fabulous clinch. In multi competitions, you are allowed to throw all kinds of knees, kicks, all kinds of elbows, and there is no limit in the UFC. Unfortunately, in Pride Fighting Championship, and unfortunately, I think also in uh, Reason Fights, elbows, I think, are not allowed. I'm not sure, though, but I think not allowed. I think they stick to Pride uh, FC philosophy, because the last match I watched, Patricio or... Was it Patrick Ifrayer? I'm sure. But he finished Luis Gustavo via that uh, soccer kick and they have a bit uh, different rules. But Mao Tai, generally, the reason I like it is that Mao Tai knee, the best way to defend a takedown attempt. All right, you can sprawl. You can go to the side. All right, maybe you have a great moment. Maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you can release your leg. Maybe you're an expert. I respect it. But if you look back at the match between Mirko Krokop and Kazuyuki Fujita, this is the match from the beginning from the beginning of Mirko Krokop's career. His left knee just countered Kazuyuki Fujita's takedown attempt. All right, Fujita survived that. I don't, I mean, he is nicknamed Iron Head for a good reason. His skull is really thicker than compared uh, to a normal MMA fighter. But... Kazuyuki Fujita went for that takedown, but he was going like this. When you shoot in, this is good because you can defend, you can, you know, go to the side. Kazuyuki Fujita went to a big distance and he went like this. Mirko Krokop countered him with a big left knee. The referee stopped the contest, I think, 30 seconds later or 20 seconds later. I'm not sure. But uh, what I know is that... Uh, Mirko Krokop had a perfect counter, which was at that time really strange. 
people were always sprawling for a takedown and it brought a new moment a bit new moment in the world of mixed martial arts because many fighters started to train that and it kind of went even further in the match between Ben Askren and uh, Jorge Masvidal because this was the first time I've seen a fly knee attempt which is a pure pure Muay Thai technique a fly knee attempt the attempt a modified fly knee attempt that turned the lights out because Ben Askren did I mean he didn't do a good job because he went also like this for a takedown Jorge Masvidal attacked him with a flying knee and comparing this match and the match with Kazuyuki Fujita these were two different techniques but the base was pretty much the same the wrestler goes for a takedown and Mao Tai guy counters with the knee this is the reason why I simply love Mao Tai and uh, I've got to remember one more fight. It's Jose Aldo versus Uriah Faber. Uh, Leoto Machida. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way to go, Kendall. Way to go. Yeah, he landed. Uh, which was that event? Remember me. I know Leoto squared off against Machida. Which was that event? When when was it? Yeah, Leoto is a karateka, but yeah, he landed too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bellator. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know it was some something like that. But yeah, Liotto is a modified karateka. He has that strong knees. I mean, in the later in the later era of uh, Bellator. Yeah, yeah. In the later stages of his career, he really modified his knees. I mean, in the beginning of his career, he didn't have it. But in the later stages, yeah, yeah. I, I love Liotto Machida pretty much. Yeah, he's. Um, I don't know what is his style of karate because he's like this and. Uh, there are many styles of karate, but Liotto, Liotto he has that very, very strong uh, left punch and that crane kick against, um, I think against Randy Couture, it was that nasty crane kick that not, knocked him out when Randy was like this. You know, it's against a guy who goes like this, it's impossible, but against a guy like this, crane kick simply nearly it's everybody in the way. Yeah, definitely. I love Liotto Machida. Um, I see you know very well about him. And yeah, Leoto Machida is a member of my top five. Unfortunately, I don't know what's going to happen for him next, but uh, when he fights, I'm always hyped. Every single time. Every single time. I mean, he had so many great, lovely stoppages. Like, especially my favorite stoppage of Leoto Machida is the one against Ryan Bader. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knocked out Randy Stutt. Yeah, you know, crane kick. You know that crane kick. Do, do you call it crane kick or a different way? Because there is a taekwondo name for this strike, but I think uh, I think it's called the crane kick regularly. Yeah, but Leoto, man, I so much love it. If you remember his fight against Bader, he switched stance and Bader goes like this and he just did this with his right hand and Bader went down, which is... Uh, the reason why karatekas are very dangerous for guys who keep uh, their hands wide because they have very narrow techniques yeah they have very very narrow techniques uh, crane kick yeah yeah i know it um, i know it is um, a korean name is flying up chagi but uh, i know it from taekwondo but in karate i think yeah yeah crane kick but uh, no, Taekwondo Black Belt, I know it's from Taekwondo, but we do it a bit different compared to Lyoto Machida because uh, Lyoto does it in a karate way, in a real, real strong karate way. And yeah, I think this is super dangerous kick. I mean, when Lyoto does it, it simply can't be bad. Simply can't be bad. Very, very great technique. About Lyoto, about the greatest advantage of karate, I think their high kicks are also good. Uh, he did once the one against Mark Munoz. If I yeah, Mark Munoz. I remember. You remember that left high kick? You know, left high kick and Mark Munoz went down. I think. I think um, it was one of his. Maybe it was a UFC fight. Can't remember the event, but I so much enjoyed this one because you know at that time I was just hoping Leoto is gonna bounce back. He was kind of in a crisis and. I was just saying, oh, please, Liotto win Mark Munoz. Mark Munoz was at his prime there. And Liotto kind of used the advantage because Munoz was a fantastic wrestler. And I knew if he takes him down that it will be a very, very big trouble. But Liotto threw one like this and a big left high kick. And the reason why I started loving him was especially that strike. 
their uh, spinning techniques, well, I don't know much on Lyoto spinning techniques. Generally, karate spinning techniques are good. And generally, they are very, very good. And uh, I think it's a good way to turn the lights out. But karatekas are pretty much with this. They go forward, backward, forward, backward. They always bounce and they move to the side. For example, I think it was a match versus Rafael Carvalho. I think Rafael Carvalho hit the fence when he went like this on Machida and Machida just slipped and moved his feet and he just hit the fence. Was it a kick or can't remember now, but it was a very, very fun to watch. It was very, very much entertaining to watch because uh, Lyoto Machida simply showed him the perfect advantage of karate. And the perfect advantage of karate is that superb movement. Never mind whether you're a Kyokushin guy, a Shotokan guy. Kyoji Horiguchi is a Shotokan guy, and you know that his movement is world-class, excellent, fantastic, brutal. I mean, yeah, Kyoji Horiguchi was the match to Kaya Sakura, everybody knows that, but what I know is that Kyoji Horiguchi is a guy maybe with one of the most best, of the greatest moments in the history of mixed martial arts, of course. I mean, Demetrius Johnson is a master of movement, but I don't think he comes from karate background. But about karate, there is also one thing I especially... Yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, ask. Yes, what about Lyoto Mark Munoz KO? Yeah, go ahead, no, no problem, ask question. Yes, Lyoto did it uh, with the left high kick. About uh, Lyoto... Mm. Ah, rewatched. Ah, great, great, great. Well, yeah, yeah, it was, I think it was one of the most superb knockouts of his career, I think. Yeah, roundhouse, roundhouse. Yeah, roundhouse. I know it is left high kick. I I know roundhouse is, you know, it can be a low kick, middle kick, high kick. I don't know in which areas of the world they call it, uh, which way they call it, I'm not sure, but I know that Lyotus High kicks are brutal, and uh, you know what is another advantage of karate? When they go for a high kick, many many martial arts go like this, you know. But karateka goes like this, and, you know, narrow strike. And this is the reason why it's very, very hard to defend against karateka. They move like a cat, and they kind of they kinda trick you with their movement. They have very, very much tricky, tricky kicks. Against Karateka, you simply have to pay attention all the time. All right, his knockout against Rashad Evans was a brawling. It was like this. I don't know which was the strike, but it was a brawling. Rashad went into a brawl. But Lyoto, yeah, he is the first guy who really showed the true power of karate. I mean, okay, George St. Pierre, he comes from karate background, but George St. Pierre was the first complete MMA fighter, you know. You know what it means? Complete. I mean, he had everything. Yeah, he comes from karate background. I mean, his kicks are world class. He, see, his kicks probably are one of the best I've ever seen. Despite I'm a Taekwondo and I love Taekwondo, but George St. Pierre kicks like hell. He kicks like hell. I mean, his kicks are even today. I don't know a guy who had so many different features and who kicked so well. I really don't know. Yeah, maybe Anderson Silva, but he comes from Taekwondo background comparing to George St. Pierre with his Karateka background. But yeah, he modified his stance. And Karate, well, the only disadvantage of Karate, if you watch the fight between Gilbert Burns and Gunnar Nelson, you have probably seen that Karateka's... All right, Guni, when he's in the when he is in the stand-up, he also goes like this. But the problem with Guni is because his legs are a bit wider. Gilbert Burns holds like this, and his legs are, you know, regular distance. I don't know how you call it. I think in my country we say it's regular distance. It's not too long or not too short. But Gunnar, he is like this and very long. It's vulnerability to take downs, but all right, Gunnar has BGG, fantastic background, so it's not a problem. But the problem is because Karate Guard... I mean, a general karate guard is super sensitive to good low kicks. Gilbert Burns was, you know, exposing this loophole against 
uh, Gunnar Nelson, and he was kicking to his leg all the time. Even in the interview with me, I asked him about that, and he said yes. He was weaker to all kicks, but yeah, we all know that Gunnar is a fantastic grappler. I mean, he's a black belt. So it's not a big deal for a guy like Guni. But for example, for a guy who is a good for a good karateka without good ground skills, this could be a very, very big problem. In Maotai, you don't have that problem because Maotai stance is pretty much narrower, and you can you can very, very easily sprawl, you can very, very easily defend a takedown from a Maotai stance from a kickboxing stance. Hmm. It can be tricky, but you can. I mean, if you move backward, it's a bit different. If you move forward, it's a bit easier. But from Maotai stance, it's very, very easy to defend uh, a takedown, which means Maotai is generally better for such things if you want to keep the fight standing. Boxing. Well, boxing has always been important. Since the opening era of the UFC, all right, there was no, how to say, there was no epic boxers then. All right, our Jimerson against Royce Gracie. I mean, it was the fight of two very, very much different styles. But today, the best boxer ever is Francis Ngannou. I don't know a better guy with boxing. I don't know a guy with with a purer boxing stance than Francis Ngannou. Boxers are generally very, very strong. All right, Kendall, you said the last time that James Stoney didn't even sprawl. Sorry, that CM Punk didn't even sprawl and that James Stoney tried to sprawl. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for this. I remember now. And uh, he sprawled well. He at least tried. In boxing, the best punches in the world. Absolutely, yes. And like in kickboxing, you have Superman punches. You have spinning back fists. You have also the same repertoire in, uh, in Mao Tai. But yes. In boxing, you don't have that strikes. But what is the advantage of boxing? You don't want to clinch up with the boxer. I mean, clinch up, if you grab him, it's a different. But if you're close to him, believe me, you're going down. When the boxer gets close, you can do like this, fine. Hook, it will pass. You must do this to defend. Overhand, the only way to defend it is this. There's no other way. If you do this, it hits. Do this, hits. Do this, hits. All right, with a hook, if you do this, you can evade it. You can even like this, but with an overhand, it's very, very tricky to evade it. So, a good boxer, like Francis Nagano, for example, uh, let's look back at his match versus Alistair Overeem. Alistair Overeem made one basic kickboxing mistake in that match. He was like this, fine. But the kickboxer, when you go for an uppercut, he does this. I mean, every kickboxer does this. It's by natural. Even my coach says, listen, you must do this when someone attacks. We normally do this. But Alistair Overeem did one. I don't want to criticize Alistair. I really love him. I mean, I really love this guy. He fights for a very, very long period of time. I even watched his earliest fights and so on. But when he did... Like this, he left it, left it open, you know, for this. He left it open. And this was a problem because Francis Nagano, he was the guy with the strongest punch until Derek Lewis broke uh, his uh, punching machine record. And Alistair Overeem, unfortunately, made that mistake. If we look back at his fight against Brock Lesnar, you might have seen that he was not doing this at all. He was always like this, despite Brock tried he tried some punches, he tried to shoot him, but Alistair was always like this. He was doing this all the time. Against Francis Nagano, it was a fatal error because Francis' punch is superb. I mean, before the last two fights, Francis Nagano wasn't using kicks. He wasn't doing kicks at all. He wasn't switching stances. He was a raw power, but he was a strong guy. He was a powerful guy. He was, he was a dude from hell, you know. And against that guy, you mustn't do such things. You mustn't do it because it will it will go against you, you know. It's the worst decision you can make, especially against a very, very strong opponent like Francis Ngannou. Boxing, in general, is good because every fighter must know to box. I mean, he doesn't have to be a boxing expert. No one asks you that. Looking back at the cage warriors, Natalia Frederick is one of the one of the greatest uh, boxers I've ever seen. 
but he's all right. I'm left-handed, but I'll try to show it. His box, his favorite boxing combo is this one, two, one. He is right-handed against Marcin Prostko. It pretty much uh, slammed Prostko's face, and uh, he won that bout via KO. Rare hand is good, but when an orthodox meets an orthodox, rare hand is good because you can continue with the lead. And, uh, sorry, rare arm is good, but you can continue with the leading arm. But against uh, a southpaw guy, you must con constantly attack with your rare hand because you must hunt him. In generally, like a southpaw guy. See, I'm a southpaw. Like when I'm a southpaw. When you do this, it's normal for me. This is a normal moment. But if you do this, I must do this, which is kind of... Um, it's not natural moment for me. Because for me, this is normal. I do everything to the left. And every southpaw do it, does it to the left. A boxer. A good boxer. Especially a southpaw boxer. He has a big advantage. When you go for a left jab, he can do this, he can do this, and he can slam you pretty hard. Or he can duck like this and slam you. This is good when you're southpaw, but if someone attacks well with his right hand or right leg, it's not good for you, unless you're a taekwondo guy, a taekwondo expert, and yeah, boxing has a lot of advantages. Yeah, another disadvantage of boxing are low kicks. Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't seen that against James Tony because Randy Couture was a wrestler, but boxers are generally vulnerable to low kicks unless they learn to check i mean everybody in boxing mma you learn to check it it's kind of normal it's kind of it's kind of a regular thing to do you know very much regular thing to do now let's look back at taekwondo some people are saying that uh, taekwondo is not for mma world all right i agree with you it's not for mma world absolutely but there are some things that can be used very well. Edson Barboza versus Terrier team, UFC 142. Do you remember that spinning heel kick that turned the lights out on Terrier team? Well, it's a Taekwondo spinning heel kick. Anderson Silva's kicks. It all comes from Taekwondo. Every single kick of his comes from Taekwondo. Even that switch kicks, even that spinning back kick, spinning heel kick, everything comes from Taekwondo. Everything. All right, he has a fantastic multi. I mean, his multi clinch is fantastic. No doubt on that. Older fans of UFC, I guess there are some... I mean, I'm a classic fan. I followed pretty much all the fighters and all the eras. Take a look at Dennis Siever and Kang Lee. They were the masters of a spinning back kick. Now, the difference between a regular spinning back kick and the taekwondo spinning back kick is because when you apply a taekwondo spinning back kick, you must... Put your leg down, but you are changing stance. For example, if you do it with your rear leg, your rear leg, in this case, right, your rear leg becomes your leading leg. And when you do a spinning back kick, you just assume like this. So you're a southpaw. You switch stance. Okay, no problem. I have no problem against it. Why not? <laughs> what is the problem? But... In general, it's kind of critical in the world of MMA because um, when you switch stance, maybe it's not the best decision for some fighters. Some fighters don't know to fight from both stances. Some do. It depends. For example, Uriah Faber knows. For example, Yato Machida knows. There are fighters who pretty much evenly use both guards, like Carlos Condit, also he knows. But fighters like, for example, Mirko Krokop, well, they don't do that. They're left-handed, he's like this or like this, and that's Mirko Krokop. He's not switching stances. Taekwondo, it's kind of good martial art, pretty much solid martial art if you attack from the distance. I don't know if you watch Bellator, but Valerie Loreda, her last fight, don't remember who she met. It was... Uh, or last, or the fight before last, can't remember, but it was a body kick. It was one, one, one punch, and then a body kick, and uh, her opponent was just like this. She punched her out once, finished with the hammer fists, and uh, Valerie Loreda, she has good taekwondo background, the black belt, and she has good spinning heel kick. Now, what I want to say, 
Spinning heel kick is good in two occasions. First, orthodox against orthodox. Fine. Or like this. If he is an orthodox too, awesome. Awesome. If he goes forward, you see, it goes into his open, into the open uh, side of his face, which is awesome. The other world class appliance is the ability to counter. For example, if you're a southpaw fighter, which is usually a specialty of southpaw fighters, whenever you attack with the right leg, I mean right low kick, right middle kick, all right, right high kick is very much dangerous to counter, but you never know if you're faster, it's possible. You can counter with a left spinning back kick or a left spinning heel kick. Punch is kind of harsh to counter with a left spinning heel kick, but you can counter it with a left spinning back kick because body is open. You see, when I attack, this part of the body remains open. Taekwondo is good if you have other sports to defend you. If you, for example, have... Uh, um, let's look at Anthony Showtime Pettis. All right. His Showtime kick against Benson Henderson is probably one of the best knockdowns ever seen, maybe even the best in the world of MMA. But what is he doing? Let's look back at his... I think it was UFC and ESPN 6, I think, or 5 against uh, against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson was holding hands like this, you know, lower stance. All right, this is Wonderboy, fine. I have nothing against it. Anthony Showtime Pettis comes from Taekwondo background. All right, he has BJJ black belt, he has kickboxing skills. All right, he is not a Taekwondo, a pure Taekwondo, but he does like this, you know, this is his stance. This, he's going like this all the time, like this or like this holding like this we call it in my country a russian guard or a double or a double guard or i don't know how you call it in other countries but we call it a russian guard and the good thing about that guard is the ability to, de to defend almost everything because you see from this this defense kick to the body kick other leg punches to the body all right, it's a bit vulnerable to uppercuts to the body, but he goes for the uppercut to the head, you can do this. He attacks to the face, hooks, you can do this very easily. About the takedowns, it's also possible, you see, because when you hold like this, you just need to put your hands down and sprawl with your hips, so it's not impossible. It's really not impossible. It's one of the best ways, actually, to counter to counter a good uh, a good grappler or grappling phenom. So about the Taekwondo, I think the Taekwondo is a good martial art, really, really good martial art if you fight of distance. And if you learn clinching, and if you, of course, have some solid background. I mean, Darren Crookshank is a Taekwondo guy, but he has background in wrestling. It's acceptable. All right, it's acceptable. Now let's look at the modifications. I don't know if you watched Cody Stamen. He is a bantamweight prospect. I also interviewed him. Cody Stamen has kicks from Taekwondo. You can just take a look at his highlights. Spinning back kick and spinning heel kick are purely Taekwondo techniques. Of course, he is trained by Darren Crookshank. This is not this is not weird. Israel Adesanya. He learned his kicking from Taekwondo. If you watched his match against Anderson the Spider Silva. You know, there was that UFC Twitter that scene, you know, troll meets troll and spinning heel kick to spinning heel kick, tornado kick to spinning heel kick. It was kind of a taekwondo, kind of section of taekwondo battle, which I like to see. It was a very, very strong stand-up affair. So, yeah, I think taekwondo is fine, but you must learn one more striking martial art and, of course, you must learn a grappling martial art, of course, I mean... No doubt on that. About Kung Fu, I honestly don't know much Kung Fu examples. In the early era of UFC and MMA, there was one guy who was something like this. He had weird stance. He was doing like this. He was a Wing Chun guy. Can't remember his name. It maybe wasn't the best choice, but he had solid results. He was, he was not bad. He was far from bad. I mean, Kung Fu is not bad at all. Kung Fu is solid even to defend the strikes. It's solid to defend low kicks, takedowns. It's kind of having everything. I think Kung Fu is not bad, but I don't know how much you can use it in, in the octagon and MMA battle because 
The basic problem of Kung Fu is the fact uh, that the martial art is not based for gloves. And in MMA, it's a sport. You have gloves. Gloves are kind of tricky. I mean, it's kind of tricky to wear gloves because uh, with gloves, you cannot, if you do this, your hands might collide. You might not be that fast. You would be extremely fast without hand, without uh, gloves. That is the problem. If you have no gloves, you can't be that fast. Now let's transition to capoeira. Many people say a lot of... I've seen negative and positive comments of capoeira. Even one of my friends trained it and people were saying that he cannot find... that he cannot fight if he doesn't have a radio. Which is kind of... They follow the pace all the time. Ah, yeah, capoeira. Yeah. They, these guys uh, kind of follow the pace all the time. But uh, the best uh, thing uh, with capoeira, you can uh, take a look. I mean, you have it on my channel, Top 7 Capoeira Kicks. But capoeira, guys, if they learn to kick, if they learn to strike, these are one of the most powerful strikes. For example, Marcus Leo Aurelio. He fought earlier. You can take a look at my channel, Top 7 Capoeira Kicks. Marcus Leo Aurelio was one of the best Capoeira guys ever. And he had, I don't know how they call, call it, because these are Portuguese uh, names, and I haven't trained that martial art. But I've seen that Marcus Leo Aurelio was turning the lights out via that fantastic kick. And uh, against Jose Cornejo, he did uh, a modified version of Capoeira switch kick which hit him here, and Cornejo went down like a wrecking ball. I remember that. So, yeah, before Mar Marcus Leo Aurelio, I was thinking that Capoeira, as you said, Milan, I was thinking that Capoeira is a ballet, and yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. But Capoeira, well, okay, it's not the most perfect solution. Far from the most perfect solution. Their spinning heel kick is very, very weird. No, it's not slow, don't get me wrong. It's super strong. It's not too slow, but it's weird because they are touching the floor with one arm. And uh, in the case they miss, you can easily you can easily counter them and you can easily take them down. But if they hit you, you will go down, which is all right, which is fine. They have some very strange kicks and you have to be very worn against them. Capoeira can be good, but my, th my thoughts are that Capoeira demands good boxing. With good boxing, Capoeira can be deadly. Their low kicks are also very weird. I mean, I don't want to say it's weak. Their strikes are not weak, but their strikes are weird. Their strikes are very, very strange. And a guy with strange kicks, with strange strikes, maybe he has the advantage, but... Uh, Today in MMA, you know what mostly coaches do? They analyze you. They put you under the radar. And you all know that. Everybody are under the radar. When you prepare someone for, for the upcoming battle, you will watch his matches. The way Gilbert Burns said, I watched my fight 40 times. But my coach, he watched it 100, 200, 300. Coaches want progress. If you meet Capera guy, your coach will probably go like, all right, let's teach his movements. Let's learn his movements. In Capoeira, when you learn to defend two or three strikes, the Capoeira guy might be in a real problem. But I'm not undermining the significance of Capoeira. I actually love it. You know, Tiago Santos did one, one, I think you call it cartwheel kick or something like this. And he missed by a hair. I think he missed John Jones by a hair, if I remember well. Was it a John Jones or some other fight? But he missed like this. If he hit, it could have been a knockout. So yeah, Thiago Santos trained it for a short period of time. But yeah, Capoeira, it has its own set of advantages. And of course, disadvantages. Grappling martial arts. Hmm. Many people are questioning which is the best grappling martial art. And I don't want to undermine any martial art. I think all of them are good. I mean, martial arts to me are like children. I can't criticize any of it. I mean, even if it's the worst martial art in the world, if it's a martial art, it's the way of fighting, it's a way of defending. What do I think? I'd vote for BJJ, of course. Other martial arts are amazing. 
Why BGG? Let's look back at the earlier era of the UFC. Do you know who was the first champ? Royce Gracie? Royce Gracie was a guy of 175-180 pounds. I don't think he weighed more than 185 at that era. I'm not sure. I mean, I've heard various stories and various, various, uh, let's say, various thoughts on him and various rumors. So I don't know what's true. I mean, people say different things, so I can't say this or this is true. But I can say one thing. Such a small guy. You know what he did to our Jimerson. You know that he submitted him, but the brightest moment of his career happened against Dan Severn. Do you know how much Dan Severn weighed? There were no weight differences back then. And you... No, no, sorry. There were no divisions. Sorry, I said wrong. Sorry. And you know that he secured that triangle choke. A guy who weighs 80, 85 kilograms to secure a triangle choke on a guy who weighs 120 kilograms. It looks like a mission impossible to me. It looked like. But I do know one thing. His BGG, it was a new martial art. It was rocking back then. It was some of the best things ever seen in the octagon. People didn't know how to counter him. People didn't know how to stay away from his submissions. I mean, against Kimo Leopoldo, Royce Gracie did one pretty much unfair moment when he grabbed his hair, but it was allowed back then. He grabbed his ponytail, but it was allowed back then. With that, uh, he, get, he got a uh, dominant uh, advantage in that match. Kimo Apollo was a Taekwondo guy, which is kind of strange because there was no stand-up fight in that match. But the main advantage of BGG is the ability to defeat 10 times stronger opponent. Yes, for example, Omoplata. Even if the fighter is 10 times stronger than you, you can finish him with Omoplata. He can be the most powerful guy in the world. For example, I was showing Omoplata to a good female friend of mine she asked me, what is the best submission if I'm 10 times weaker? I said, what do you want to learn? She said, when I'm on my back. All right, you're on your back, fine. I showed her my plata. She was like, whoa, so easy. I mean, but she said, you can escape. No, I can't escape. No, I can't escape. She said, yes, you can. No, I can't. And I was, when she finished it, when she was holding my plata tight, I was trying to roll and it was very, very hard to roll out of it. So Omoplata, it creates a pressure here and it hurts a lot. There are some submissions that are very, very nasty. For example, if you watch Chaim Gozali, I mean, Chaim Gozali, he has only one knockout victory. Chaim Gozali, well, even in an interview with me, Chaim was constantly saying, all right, I like to fight on my back. I'm a BGG guy. Fine, you are a BGG guy. And I respect that so much. I, I love BGG fighters. I love to watch them on the ground. In his last match against Arthur Pronin, Arthur Pronin was annihilating him strong. He was he was literally demolishing him. He was I, I don't know what to say. Chaim was losing. And out of nowhere, Chaim grabs his leg, leg submission. Good night. The match is over. Same like his son Aviv. His son Aviv even broke the record when he Manari rolled into Vladimir Muravitsky, a Belarusian guy, and finished him with an 11-second submission, which is the fastest submission in the history of uh, Bellator MMA. So, yeah, it was a great. In the history of BGG, there were many good grapplers. For example, look at Damien Maia. I mean, Damien Maia is top 10 for uh, top 10 of UFC welterweight and middleweight. I mean... For a very, very long time. Damien Maia, I don't know even how long he competes, but he competes for a very, very long period of time. I played UFC 3 Undisputed earlier, and Damien Maia was on that game. I mean, there was John Jones and so on, but Damien Maia survived, man. He was a middleweight back then. So, yeah, Damien Maia, one of the best grapplers ever. All right, we got Rafael Lovato Jr., we've got Neyman Gracie, we've got Kron Gracie too. We've got Gary Tone in one FC. They are pretty much strictly BGG guys, but their style is related to ground fighting on the other side. 
the next martial art all martial arts are good man i mean i respect every single martial art i'm not fan of wrestling but i'm not a big fan of wrestling but wrestling is good i mean good wrestlers they can control everybody if a good wrestler grabs you like matt hughes did and slams you off the canvas well it hurts man he's the first guy who literally kicked Ro royce grace's ass you know that you all know that because uh, matt hughes he out wrestled royce grace he was holding him down he had that ground and pound strikes he controlled him he really controlled him and matt hughes was a very very strong guy in many cases wrestlers are super strong guys with the endless endless power and this is something i really like them for example all right fedor emelianenko is a tough dude i mean you remember when when kevin randleman german suplexed him to the ground you know he caught him there and bang over himself and fedor continued fighting and i was like whoa the man fell he just fell on his head and he just continues fighting i was like all right randleman is strong but but fedor was even stronger randleman is also the first guy who hammer fisted the uh, hammer fisted Merkel crock up so yeah wrestling is strong all right brock lesnar had good wrestling really really good wrestling there were good wrestling guys in the world of mma i didn't all right ben Askren had good wrestling career outside of ufc yes outside of ufc he was unbeatable he even finished shinji Aoki, one of the best japanese grapplers in 57 seconds i mean all right what i say you know he had so for that this is what i like to say but he just didn't have many success in the world of ufc maybe because the guys were prepared for him and so on all right he finished robbie lower but many people say the stoppage was controversial robbie protested after that stoppage and to be honest when i was watching it his arm went limp but I i'm unsure whether he was out or not because i only saw his arm went limp went like this this is the only thing i saw but i didn't see that he was stepping that he surrendered and so yeah wrestling is generally good i mean wrestler can mount you control you on the ground he can control you of the side he can control your back wrestler can do many things good wrestler is a master of fighting on the ground you know strong punches hammer fists all right brock lesnar's trademark were hammer fists you all know that hammer fists in you know what's an interesting thing hammer fist originally comes from altai comes from altai background but generally a strong strong hammer fist it's a trademark of a wrestling guy modestus bukowskis is not a wrestler but i've seen him many times controlling the fighter from the back mount and doing these uppercuts and punches to the back of the head and strong punches but these transitions come from wrestling and the most entertaining wrestling transition is when matt hughes grabs the legs uh best base for mma's cardio yes uh yeah i still i still don't know how i kendall i agree with you yes best base for mma's cardio yes 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 absolutely yes yes this mma yes best base for mma is cardio i will discuss that later absolutely cody stamen also said this uh, in an interview with me he also said that uh, if you're a guest you're out absolutely agree yeah for wrestling all right z all right sorry z sorry z i misspelled all right so z to answer your question yeah cody stamen cody stamen said that in uh, an interview with me if you're a guest you're out so yeah absolutely if you get if you're a guest your skills and strikes are so much slower you can't defend well and yeah guess no skill yeah absolutely so your strike instead of like this it will go like this and it has no power uppercut goes like this you can't sprawl you can't brawl you can't all right you can run around the circles and you can pray the fight is going to over to be over as so asap the way they say and yeah in the fight between cody stamen and song yadong song yadong was pretty much guessed in the last two minutes of the fight but cody stamen had the 
had his cardio all the time you know there are some guys in the world of mma that never that i've, ne I've never seen some guys guest for example colby covington kamar usman i've never seen him guest let's see i've never seen demetrius johnson guest hmm, who else hmm, but there are many yeah diaz brothers yeah diaz brothers they always have they're always uh, they're always fighting in the same intensity Jorge Masvidal, I think I have never seen him guest. Let's see. John Jones, hmm. I think I haven't, but John Jones fights like a tactician. Is there some other guy? Kyoji Horiguchi never gets guest. Hmm. I'm start. I'm thinking now. Hmm. I don't know. Many fights. I mean, Nate Diaz is very, very good in rounds four and five. George St. Pierre, I also think I haven't seen him guest. Uh, you like hentai? Well, not pretty. Hentai is okay. Okay, I mean, fair. I mean, I don't like, I don't dislike. I'm kind of neutral. No, I'm neutral to this, you know. Fair and not fair. I mean, you know, in the middle. Uh, ha. All right. Uh, Kendall. Oh, Kimbo Slice versus Data 5000. <laughs> oh, Kendall, why are you doing this? You're making me laugh. Yeah, both fighters were guests early on, and it looked like they were throwing punches underwater. And then, you know what happened then? Data collapsed in a bizarre fashion when Kimbo Slice missed with something that was looking like a right hook. But it was everything but a right hook because the guy was knocked out by dust of air. Did I say well, Kendall? <laughs> yeah. Kimbo Slice versus Dead of 5000. <laughs> I think, you know, if we talk about this fight, and if we talk about, I mean, Gabriel Gonzaga, he had bad cardio, but versus Kevin, Kevin, how was his last name? I think UFC 56 or something like that. Crowd was even yelling, go home, go home. I, I can't remember, but yeah, Gonzaga had a very, very bad cardio. And uh, yeah, so Z is right, absolutely. If you don't have a good cardio, you're out. If you're a guest in the first round or the first two rounds, Andy Young, one of the best Northern Irish fighters, he was also in an interview with me, and I asked him, all right, uh, yes, Romero is interesting, he guesses, but can get it back in the fight. Very good at staying calm and resting, yes. Yes, absolutely agree. Yes, yes. Yeah, he looks tired, but he can always explode. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Z. But I think his cardio, you know, his... I don't want to say bad cardio. I'm not saying he has bad cardio. He has fair cardio. But I think his, uh, let's say, weaker cardio comes from here, from his, uh, I think, insane weight cut. Because I think Romero cuts a lot of weight. Now, to get back at the story of Andy Young, I asked him, Andy, are you a cardio machine? He said, well, I am now. I said, how do you mean I am now? Well, he said, listen, in the first two or three fights, I was guessed after one or two minutes, and I didn't know what to do. But then I started working on cardio, 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 cardio. So that's the reason why Andy Young today never gets guessed. He definitely took a good rest versus Kennedy. Yes, yes, he definitely did. But Joel Romero, uh, his fight against Paulo Costa, I think, uh, I think it was a strange fight for Romero because I got used to, I got used to on Romero, you know, like Z said, I got used to Romero to how he says to to stay calm, resting, and explode. Against Costa, Romero was pretty much he was fighting. You know, he was growing, and this doesn't look like him. I was like, uh, is this a different version of your Romero? Because against Widman, he was waiting, 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 and countered with that devastating fly knee. Against Leoto Machida, he took him down and hammered him, finished the bout on the ground. He was using his wrestling. But against Paulo Costa, we've seen a different ver version of your Romero. Yeah, it was a battle of bodies, of course. But I don't know... I don't know. Maybe Romero has worked on his cardio. Maybe, maybe he has uh, made some changes into his uh, 
into his overall training sessions and so on. But he is a different type of a fighter now. And uh, yeah, some fighters are pretty much uh, not ready to fight for five rounds. For example, Robert Whittaker. I don't think he has the best cardio in the world, but he is a very, very smart fighter. He will not brawl all the time, as well as you know. He is a very, very smart guy, a very smart dude. On the other side, Israel Adesanya battled five rounds against Kelvin Gastelum, and both of them are were fighting well. Tony has best cardio. Hmm. Mm, which fight specifically do you mean? Because uh, when I was watching Tony every single time, every single fight that I was watching Tony, he either hurt his opponent, either finished him very early on. I mean, uh, I watched Tony feud. Yeah, yeah, I know Tony Ferguson, but uh, which fight did he show that cardio especially? I know he is a beast. Absolutely know he is the beast. But I watched many Tony's fights. Yes, Rafael dos Santos, yes, yes, yes. But many of Tony's fights that I was watching, he just dominates, 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 dominates. That's the only thing Tony Ferguson is doing. I mean, he is doing this all the time. The only thing he's doing is domination. <laughs> because Tony Ferguson, yeah, yeah, when you mention Tony Ferguson, what do you think, uh, Z, what do you think of Khabib's cardio? Yeah, I guess uh, because you mentioned Tony Ferguson, many people are saying that Khabib has the best cardio, but I think Ferguson has better cardio. What do you think? Uh, yeah, he outputs so much for you. Do you think that Khabib has a good cardio too? I think he has good cardio, but not better than, than Tony's because Tony really never gets guessed. Absolutely never gets guessed from the fights I've seen. I mean, I'd like to see him to, to see Tony, you know, battle, battling for five rounds, but five rounds with someone very, very, very strong. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, against Rafael dos Santos, yes, but uh, you know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see. Tony, I'd like to see Tony, you know, at the end of the fifth round, fighting, brawling, fighting, brawling, fighting, brawling. But it won't happen because Tony dominates everybody. I mean, Tony is simply... I, I don't think there was a, such a dominant fighter in the history of UFC. I don't think... I mean, when we talk about cardio. Yes, I will. Uh, I don't bet, but I uh, but I vote for Tony also. Because if Khabib doesn't take him down, he'll get bettered. He can't stand up Tony. There is no way he can stand up Tony. He can defeat Tony in the stand up. I think nobody can defeat Tony in the stand up. There is no such kind of a fighter. Even I wouldn't bet on Justin Getty because Tony in the stand up is a real beast. Real beast in the stand up. Yeah, in the stand up, no way. No way. Absolutely no way. Even McGregor is, uh, you know, a small person for Tony's stand up. McGregor has very strong strikes, but compared to Tony, I mean, you, he, you, he broke. Serone, you know, he cracked Serone's eye, he broke Patty's arm. What else should we say? I mean, he's a beast with strong heart, even if he takes him down, elbows and tricky guard. Tony's too tough. Hmm. Mm, elbows, fine. Mm, what do you mean by tricky guard? Do you think uh, he's rubber guard? Do you think uh, he's X guard? Do you think, uh, do you think he's butterflies or tricky guard can mean a lot of things? Uh, would you kindly explain, Z? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see Khabib leading too. There is no way he can defend that. Me if I'm wrong. I think he has a better bottom game than anyone who Khabib has fought. Yes, yes. I also think uh, he has a better. He has better. Maybe it won't be enough, but he will give Khabib mm, definitely, definitely. Because hmm, uh, may I say something? Uh, but promise me you won't get angry. I think Khabib will hardly take this guy down because Tony has superb, uh, superb defense, superb takedown defense. He can take him down only if Tony, only if Tony wants that, you know. Uh, Tony can go to the ground only if Tony wants to go to the ground. I, it's very hard to take him down. <laughs> but no, maybe you won't agree. No, seriously, may, maybe you will disagree. But uh, I don't think it's easy to take Tony down, especially when he goes. He's always special. Yes, he is a wrestler in the first place, but uh, Tony is a cardio machine in the first in the first place, and also a very very smart guy. He is not, you know, just bro, bro, bro. Tony is smart. Tony is, I think, too smart for, for Khabib, because uh, Tony is not fighting like a regular like a regular guy. Tony is fighting like a guy who thinks who thinks twenty four hours. You know, a constant thinker. And I afraid I afraid of. Uh, of uh, such fighters because uh, yeah 
Tony is definitely a very, very strong guy. And uh, Tony is a guy who, who honestly gives everything uh, he has into his strong, strong game. So, yeah. When it comes to Tony, I simply love this guy. Because Tony, yeah, he will give a strong, a strong test to Khabib. Absolutely. And his wrestling is kind of good. His cardio game is good. His punches are good. Um, I don't know about knees. Um, I haven't seen Tony throwing much knees, but he has uh, very strong kicks. Yes, I agree with you. Tony has insane mindset for being a fighter. I imagine he will hit the speed back for five hours. That type of guy. Yeah, absolutely. Tony is ready to fight everybody, but <laughs> I don't think anybody can parry him in that. But I'd like to see someone fighting Tony with five rounds. But you know, five rounds of high volume. But five rounds of high volume, really high volume. Nobody can withstand that because Tony is a beast. Tony is a real beast. But, you know, five rounds of maybe slow-paced fighting, fine, no problem. But five rounds of high-intense fighting with Tony, no way. Absolutely no way. Because, yeah, Tony trains all the time. I mean, all right, he had that, I think he had that mental issues and so on, but I believe it's behind him. I believe, I believe it was just... Uh, a bad phase in his life and i believe he got back stronger than ever i believe he is now a real real machine a very very strong powerful guy so yeah i think if tony loses to khabib nobody will dethrone khabib definitely even justin getty can justin getty can can dethrone him can dethrone him in the first two rounds but in third fifth fourth no uh yes when he fought cowboy his pace just gets faster and faster yeah yeah yeah, in the first round, Tony was kind of against Cowboy. I don't want to say he was bad, but he was... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it was. But he was... I don't want to say ugly word about Tony, but in the first round against Cowboy, it, it um, he didn't look like himself. He looked like... Uh, you know what is a sniper? A Mr. Sniper in, in the military, Mr. Sniper. Mr. Sniper, you go, a sniper guy, a, a patient guy, a guy who thinks, who waits for his target, who waits for his opportunity, constantly going up. In the first round, I don't think it's Tony, it's some, um, yeah, Marsman, Marsman, yeah, yeah, thank you, Kendall. In the first round, I mean, in every single first round, it was Mr. Marksman, and uh, definitely it was a guy who, who paid a lot of attention to his... To his striking, to his grappling, and of course, to his lovely, lovely cardio. I don't think there has ever been, you know, such a physical guy like Tony. Because when you take a look at Tony, who would say? I mean, he's not a muscle machine. He's not a muscle emperor. He's When you see Tony, you see a guy who likes to fight. You see a guy who likes to train. You see a guy who is ready to train. But you don't see a guy who, who's going to go on a fashion week. And this is the reason why I think Tony is a good guy. A really, really good guy. Now another martial arts, judo. Hmm. Yoshinokami was a good judoka. But before Ronda Rousey, there was, there was not much attention in judo. There was Karo Parishian. There were some fighters. But when Ronda Rousey came, eight armbar victories. I mean, what else should we say? an Olympic judoka, and whenever she grabbed someone's arm, she was finishing. But in um, in other words, yeah, judo is known for that arm bar, but trips, throws are awesome. But there is one big downside of judo. You know, you do a judo match in a gi, which is fine. It's okay. It's okay, no problem. But uh, in an MMA bout, you don't have a gi. It's not allowed. It was allowed in the early days and... Uh, it was allowed in the early days of UFC, but new rules, regulations, and all fighters are in shorts. And now, doing judo throws without a gi, it can be tricky, you know. There is MMA judo, of course. I don't think it's bad. For example, Keina Watanabe, if you follow, if you follow Ryzen and Bellator at Bellator 237, if you watch her match against Ilara Joanne, I think it's Ilara Joanne, or however you call it, uh, Kenna was throwing her many times via judo throws, 
And yeah, judo throws can be very, 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 very useful in the world of uh, mixed martial arts, but uh, you can't train without a gi. Judo clinch is good, but over-unders are kind of weird. And, uh, you know, single collar clinch, it's kind of weird for judoka because it's more like for a Muay Thai guy or for a wrestling guy. So you have to be a very, very much modified judoka in the world of uh, mixed martial arts if you want to succeed in judo. On the other side, let's now go to Sambo. Sambo is a Russian martial art, and Fyodor, Fedor Emelianenko, he is, uh, he is a master of Sambo. Yeah, Casey Kenny is a judoka. Thank you so much. I, com I completely forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And about Fedor, well, you know what is a weird thing? The trademark of Sambo are leg locks. All right, it's great. But Fedor was finishing everybody via armbar. I mean, when I looked back at his Pride Fighting Championship history, I was watching him a lot. Yeah, he had good boxing, I mean, no doubt. Fedor had one of the best boxings ever. But he was finishing everybody almost with that armbar, which is okay. But Sambo, Sambo is generally a skill that focuses on leg locks. And yeah, Sambo is good. They have good throws. They have good takedowns, they have good leg locks, arm locks. Yeah, it's a good martial art. Uh, Hong Man Choi, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hong Man Choi, yeah, yeah. Hong Man Choi, man. Such a big guy, such a big dude. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Fedor armbarred almost everybody, man. I mean, in his early, in his early pride days, he was, he was not a beast, man. He was a beast, beast. He was... You, everybody who studied the octagon, sorry, inside the square ring with him, he was losing. He had a streak, I think, of 30 wins or 32. I'm, it was it was some kind of an insane streak. Nobody could have defeated him. And yeah, Sambo is good martial art, definitely, from grappling martial arts. There are, I think, others if we missed something. But yeah, in grappling, I mean, grappling, grappling, like a pure grappling... I see it as a combination of BGG and other martial art and arts. And, uh, you know, they train in rush guards, which is okay. But you don't have a rush guard in, uh, how to say, in an MMA battle. I, I don't know whether it's good or bad because some people say it's good, some people say it's bad. Um, I'm not a guy with a strong BGG background, so I can't comment on that. I'm just a very, very big fan of BGG. I'm just. For example, until Rosie Marpolhara started uh, make, making, you know, his stupidities, he didn't want to let go of the submission. And you know that he was suspended on 90 days, then sent off from the UFC. But until he started making stupidities, I pretty much loved him a lot because when he grabs your limp, <coughs> it was almost impossible to escape. And there were many guys who made uh, such a good breakthrough of uh, of BGG and other grappling martial arts, but now which could be the best combination? <laughs> there are many guys who who are you know pure MMA. Um, for example, Steve Amable, a Cage Warriors featherweight title contender, he just said in an interview, you know, I'm an MMA guy. He didn't want to go to the ground with Mats Brunel because Mats has better jiu-jitsu, which is normal. But Steve Amable just said, you know, I'm I'm pretty much all rounder. Yeah, Rodolfo. Yeah, um, he just said, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to go because I'm all rounder. For example, Corey McKenna is uh, also an all rounder. Oh, sorry, I didn't see the comment. Young Badru Hari for Choi. Yes, he made his debut that year. He has the best BGG style for MMA. Hmm. Hmm. You know, this is a topic to think. I watched him a few times, but. Uh, mm, Mm. Why do you think he has that? Can you please answer? I mean, I've seen Rodolfo. Yeah, he is good in BGG. Uh, what makes him special, for example, compared to Charles Oliveira, who has the greatest number of uh, submission wins in MMA, and uh, mm, he's all about passing the guard? Well, yes. Yes, BGG guys rarely do that. Yes, BGG guys uh, mostly close guard, but yeah, he's passing guard. His top game guard pass, 
Oh yeah, back tech. Yeah, when a BGG guy takes your back, there is no escape. <laughs> yeah, Rodolfo. Yes, Damian Ma is also is also a specialist when he you know rare naked choke. He is a super specialist for that. But yeah, yeah, Rodolfo's passing guard skills are good. Yeah, very good. Because BGG guys, they mostly lay on their back and they don't uh, let you pass their guard. But yeah, you're right. Rodolfo, I mean, he's not, a according to this, uh, he's not a classical guy. Sharper and more diverse BGG. But for style, BGG has the right style. Same as Maya, good point. Uh, what do you, what do you think is the right style of BJJ for an MMA uh, battle? Do you think it's not uh, it's something that mixes uh, the game of the back, the game on the top, and passing guard, or something uh, something different? Because I'm a very very big fan of this, and all the BJJ guys I know, except of Rodolfo, it translates well from BJJ to MMA. Some BJJ guys have bottom game fancy gear style. This doesn't work as well as in MMA. Yes, true. Yes, true, it won't work well. In MMA, you got to modify because you have no gi. When you have gi, you can grab it, you can do many other submissions and so on. For example, bow and arrow choke. Sorry, bow and arrow choke. And some other some other great ways to defend. But fancy game, no. In MMA, there is no fancy game. In MMA, there is skill. In MMA, in MMA... There is an MMA. I mean, <laughs> there is no fancy. There is no fancy play. Having to deal, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. Kendall Haim Gozali said said the same thing in an interview with me. I asked him why do you have all the first round submissions. He said, you know, if I finish someone in the first round, he is not sweaty. It's almost impossible to finish him later. A spider guard. You see, it works in BJJ. Maybe in the street, even with clothes. But I really like the BJJ guys who do the basics, like. Rickson, Maya, and Rodolfo, that style. Ah, Rickson, yeah, yeah. Rickson was doing the basics, absolutely. But Maya, Maya is, Maya is, I think, uh, I think an MMA BGG guy. I think his uh, BGG is pretty much MMA oriented. I mean, we haven't seen much of that against Askren because I, th I even think Maya was not interested in finishing him. It, it looked to me like that way, like he wanted to battle for three rounds. But against other guys, yeah. Yeah, but in last match against Askren, I don't know. I mean, was it a tactics or... But, okay, Askren is good on the ground. I don't I don't think Askren is bad on the ground. He is amazing on the ground. But maybe Maya didn't want... Maybe it wasn't Maya's, Maya's intention. Royce Gracie said he wore again his MMA belt to absorb the sweat of his opponents. Yes, I remember that statement. Yes, I remember that. And uh, I believe it kind of helped him. Like it kind of helped him against many opponents because many opponents were bare knuckle then, and they didn't wear they didn't wear um, a gi. And I don't even remember was he fighting a guy who wore a gi? I think once or twice. Mm, I'm trying to remember. That's interesting. Mm, I've heard of that. I've heard of that of that discussion. I've heard of that. Yeah, Rice Gracie said that until it was allowed. I don't know when they prohibited that, but against uh, Ken Shamrock, I think it helped him a lot, definitely, in Royce Grace's battle against Frank, against Ken Shamrock. Yeah, they they were very, very strong guys, both of them. But Royce, the other side, Royce was never a super strong guy. He was a super technical guy. <clears throat> yeah, I know it got banned, but I don't know at which event. I forgot. Was it a UFC 7, 8, 10? I, I forgot completely, but they banned it pretty much, pretty pretty much quickly because Royce was dominating. <laughs> yeah, I know they banned it pretty much, pretty much quickly. And uh, you know, when it happened, I started to hate MMA. I was like, "Why are you doing this, guys? Why are you doing this?" I just started to enjoy, and you're banning one of the best things in the world, very nagi. I mean, all right, each sport has rules. I mean, I agree and. When that happened, I was a kid back then, you know, and my dad asked me, hey, Vlad, why are you crying? You know what I said? They banned the gig. He was like, come on, man, you're, was I eight, nine? I can't remember how, how old was I. He was saying, you're crying for a stupid thing. Why are you doing this? 
I said, but dad, they banned geese. And he was like, he was like, are you insane? You're a kid. Yeah, I'm insane, but I love MMA. You can't, I mean, you can't criticize me for that. I love MMA. What am I going to do? But I remember that, yeah, Kendall, when, when it got banned, I was like, I was thinking it's unfair, but on the other side, every sport uh, must have its own set of rules and every sport, every single sport must um, must have its own trademarks and such things. It was kind of a reasonable decision, but to our real fans, it was not more style against style. It was fighter against fighter. It was guy against guy. It was, you know, it changed. It changed everything in the world of MMA that prohibiting is. And do you remember UFC 7? Before UFC 7, they prohibited headbutts. I don't know if you remember that. But even when that happened, it was kind of sad decision too. Because headbutts were bringing the advantage to wrestlers. For example, Shamrock was known for that nasty headbutts. And when it was prohibited, he was like, oh no, what am I going to do now? He was mounting guys, headbutting them, punching them in that way, and it was suddenly, suddenly prohibited. And Shamrock lost one of his main weapons. It was kind of so much unfair. But there were many changes in the world of MMA, and the way it looks like now, <clears throat> there are two styles, you know, old Pride FC and that regular normal UFC that exists today. I don't know. I mean, soccer kicks and uh, foot stomps, it was bringing some new dimension. I mean, in today's UFC, I kind of have a feeling that grapplers and wrestlers are more protected. And I pretty much think that uh, soccer kicks are fair. I don't know. I would let soccer kicks and such things because in this way, it's kind of harder to finish the opponent. I mean, soccer kicks maybe give more advantage to strikers or, I don't know, but in a normal way, soccer kick, soccer kick is a good way to finish someone or a foot stomp is a good way to finish someone. Unfortunately, with these limits, I don't even know what's going to be next. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely knees to the head. Well, there were so many, so many fights in Pride FC were finishes via knees from side control or even from not south position. But unfortunately, it's not allowed. And, you know, Kevin Randleman did it. To, oh, how was that guy's name? I forgot. You know, when Kevin Randleman was doing knees from, from not south, but how was the name of that guy? The referee stopped uh, the contest pretty much quickly. I can't remember his name. He was like one second knee, one second knee, one second knee, and the bout was waved off so quickly. So yeah, knees to the head are also a fantastic way to finish the fight. And unfortunately, <laughs> bouts are obviously make made to last to last longer because someone probably doesn't want so many knockouts or whatever. I mean, when I see an event where you have two or three stoppages. Uh, I mean, it's good because fighters are training, because they are prepared, they are ready, and so on. But we need stoppages. We need we need uh, more dynamic bouts. In the early era of UFC, <clears throat> there was no other way to to leave the octagon undefeated. I mean, one of the fighters had to lose, and today. Draw is normal. I mean, draw happens from time to time. It can be controversial or not, but every single result today, um, there are many, too many rules that really much, that really much protect the grounded opponent, which is in some cases it's fair. But for example, in Brazilian Valetudo, soccer kicks are also allowed. In some Japanese uh, federations are allowed. In some Balkan federations from Balkan Peninsula, I think FFC also allow, allows uh, soccer kicks, and I'm curious what do you think of this. Instead of having rounds, the fight should be just for 5, 10, 50, 20 minutes. Well, you know, uh, it was... Uh, yes, of course. In the early era of UFC, uh, that was, uh, I think, even proposed or... 
Yeah, 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 I agree. I mean, this is a good idea because in the early era of UFC, uh, there was no rounds and it showed that the guy who has better cardio was always winning. So yeah, 10-point system, it can be unfair. Yeah, this, I think it's a good idea because uh, if I work for a takedown and then the round is over, the guy gets to escape for free. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. But uh, would it give advantage to BGG guys or or other guys? I don't know. Would it give? I don't know. M maybe it would. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Maybe someone would scramble up. I really don't know. But uh, yeah, five minutes for original fights could be good. But uh, twenty minutes for champions. Hmm. You know what? If Khabib and Tony fight lasts for twenty minutes, Khabib would be, would be guessed at fifteen or sixteen, but Tony would never be guessed. So for Tony, it would be the best change one could make in the history of UFC. But guys that are not cardio machines would probably be very angry. Where the BJJ guy cooks somebody and gets a submission at maybe eight minutes in, instead of breaking them up and seeing a decision. Well. Um, I don't know how is I don't know how much is this realistic to to I mean it's possible at the eighth or tenth minute but the opponent is sweaty and uh, okay it's possible but uh, hmm. yeah maybe I mean it's a good idea why not why not no it's not boring no it's not why why is it boring no if BJJ guy does it why why he's going for submissions he's uh, He's working. He's not. Uh, it's boring when a wrestling guy does it. It's boring when a wrestling guy does it because they hold, 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 hold. This is what I don't like. But BJJ guy, why not? For me, if you work on a submission, you should never raise fighter up. You know, you should never say get up, never. But if you hold him down and does do nothing, all right. I mean, it's boring. But if uh, if you do something on the ground, why you shouldn't uh, get them up? Or for example, in the clinch, uh, how about round ends with you inside control? The next, mm -hmm. hmm. I need to think a bit. All right, I will answer. Just uh, give me thirty seconds. Never thought of that. So hold on a second. Just mm, I must think. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, if the fight has no 10 point rule system then maybe this maybe your idea makes sense yeah yeah but um, I'm trying to answer because uh, um, how to say without 10 point system your idea would be okay why not because you were finishing the side control and let him continue. Yeah, maybe fighters need to rest. Maybe doctor needs to step in. Maybe someone is hurt. Maybe, you know, if the match lasts for 20 minutes, what would happen, for example, if a doctor say, all right, you must stop. So I, you know, I must apply a Vaseline on your cut. And uh, um, this part could be critical, but uh, this is maybe the best idea. So yeah the way Kendall said if you make your own promotion you could actually be you could actually be a revolutionary guy with that yeah would be would be yeah yeah Z, listen I thought a bit and uh, maybe one day you could you could think of creating your own promotion under these rules this would be no this would be a unique spectacle why not this would be a unique spectacle why not why not I mean uh, Data 5000 was talking about some triangular ring or triangle, triangular, triangular ring or, you know, triangle in their bare knuckle promotion. And people were like hyped of that. I don't know whether it happened or not, but why not? No, really. I think your idea is great. No, no, I, I'm seriously talking to you now. No, I'm not joking. I'm deadly serious. No, no, seriously. I swear. To Christobot Silevsky, they are two of the most sane people in my country. I, I really think your idea is good. Because uh, continuing, for example, side control to side control is okay. Why not? But uh, you would have to think of, uh, how to say, 
Uh, what would you do with the doctor stoppages? And for example, doctor says, listen, I must stop the fight because the guy is bleeding. And, you know, you, you might have that problem that is number one. And the second problem, uh, would you keep 10 point system or you would do some uh, changes, some rule changes or um, 10 point system? Mm, do you understand what am I asking you? Yeah, these are maybe two challenges you would have to face. For example, if someone is hurt, you must stop the fight because it doesn't have to be judged TKO and you, you have to give someone a chance to continue if he wants. I don't want it to happen again, Jorge Masvidal versus uh, Nate Diaz. Yeah, I'm listening to you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No problem. Yeah, I guess it's some interesting point system because points are... Yeah, someone can fight for three rounds and waste time in the last two and win the fight, which is kind of unfair because there I support rising rules and pride rules more. The bout is looked as a whole. So, yeah. Uh, I will be, get back in one minute, so yeah, please write, and uh, in one minute I'm back. Hey, I'm back. So let's see. I think there are three kinds of rounds. One point, if it is a close round, could go either way. Two points for a solid round and three points for a dominate round, current 10-8. I think calling it 10-9 is so stupid. Why don't you call 10-9 round just a one-point round? <laughs> it's a good idea. Why not? If you, if you destroyed someone, you can give him three points. Why not? Uh, how would you how would you rule a knockdown rule or um, how do you, one knockdown two knockdowns uh, when someone really 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 dominates you know when someone really dominates for example when he goes to the ground so many times and how would you rule that One point to each opponent if it's a close round. All right, makes sense. No, winner of the round gets one, two, or three points. Hmm. Hmm. This is very interesting debate. I never think of uh, this way. Hmm. So three points. Hmm. Uh, would you go, for example, on three, two, or something uh, like that? For example, if there were both knockdowns and. Uh, so yeah, three points are okay, absolutely. So would you go for three, two, three, one? And how would you? Yes, yes, yes. It's basically that. Uh, how would you regulate that? For example, two knockdowns, three knockdowns, uh, pure domination. <clears throat> if both guys did damage. Yeah, if both guys did damage. Yeah, it's close. Hmm. It makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. If the round is close and... Hmm. But would you make some rule, for example, I don't know, for big takedowns? We're judging the difference, not the total damage. But I also think judging fights based on total damage works too. If both guys get a knockdown, they both get points. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, you know about multi scoring. If the fight is very close, a guy who did more damage wins. 
So I guess you would uh, follow the same routine. Like one point round could be a round where nothing happens or a round where it is back and forth. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's 10-9 today, I guess. I guess it's 10-9 today, such a round. I mean, I don't know. I'm not an MMA judge. I'm a soccer judge, but I follow MMA for a whole my life. But they are constantly changing that rules. And <coughs> I'm kind of... I'm kind of seen so many, I don't want to criticize judges, but I've seen so many unrealistic decisions, very, very weird decisions and very, very much strange decisions. A two point round would be maybe not domination, but clearly one guy wins. Hmm. Why not? No, um, I think, I think it absolutely makes sense. Yeah, good rules, definitely good rules. You could make one day a promotion. You know, I mean, if you find some sponsor or someone to support your idea, it's, I think it's good. I really think it's good. Think about this. Uh, how many fights do we see with two close rounds and then one dominate round? In my system, that would be a draw. But as it is now, they give it to the guy who won the first two. So it's similar to the 10-9. Even he barely won it, then thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me guess. Uh, how many fights do you see two clones? Hmm. Well, it would be more fair. Uh, I'm I'm replying to this. It would be more fair because if you annihilate someone in round three, but you lost via close decision first two rounds, it could be a draw. Why not? It could be a draw. I think I think it could be a draw. Because uh, why not? Barely wins round one. Uh, dominate, but not 10 8. Why not? The draw is fair, absolutely fair. And today you will not see a draw in such in such a way. You will not see a draw in MMA. And it's kind of unfair. Yeah, it's it's a great no, it's great. It's awesome. It's a fantastic idea. It's I think that there would be there would have been less controversy on the judges' scorecard, and you know how many controversial matches I've seen in the last in the last year. I mean, especially Trinaldo versus Hernandez. When I saw that, I was like, <coughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand? I understand you absolutely. And yes, yes, yeah. I mean, in today's rules, you have. 10 9 and you will hardly see an even round i don't think even it's even round uh three two maybe people think justin scoggins won but really said probably won the first and third but it was barely hmm. i don't know who won there it was a close match but uh, to be honest i really have no idea who would i give advantage on the scorecards Kendall, it could be one point for round one, one point for round two, but then two points in round three and the other side, two, two, draw. Yes, yes. I think it's a good idea. I think I've never heard someone thinking in this way, so you could you could have a unique promotion, man. Or if someone really dominates the third, then yes, someone could win even if they are down two rounds. Why not? It kind of more reminds me on pride rules, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, open scoring. Why not? Open scoring is good. Open scoring is good. Open scoring is absolutely good. And open scoring maybe it maybe leads to controversies, but open scoring is a really, really good idea to it's a good way to engage the fighters. It's a good way to to keep the to pick up the pace. I mean open scoring would maybe make them pick up the pace maybe maybe they would know that um, they have to fight that there is no much uh, tactics there is no much uh, escaping maybe the fights would be better maybe maybe the crowd would love it more i'm in the idea i mean in the piece of paper yes 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 if rounds out aren't with the same so yeah you had situation when where someone lost uh, for example three rounds in a title shot and he cannot win in your promotion in your promotion even if you lost 
three rounds. You could uh, kick his ass in the fourth and fifth and uh, win the match. I mean, if you go for five rounds, but uh, if you go for the uh, lower number of rounds, then then all right. I mean, yeah, rounds shouldn't be scored the same, but it would be different from today's. 10 to 8. I wish the judges would be interviewed afterwards to explain themselves. Tell us what they saw and why they judge it. Sometimes there could be a good explanation. <laughs> sometimes. Yes, sometimes. But unfortunately, at UFC judges, for example, Trinaldo versus Hernandez. Trinaldo bettered him for three rounds and Hernandez won via anonymous decision. I was like, you know, not i was not shocked i was i was staggered i was stunned i was i was so disappointed at the ufc i mean how could have he won him i mean listen i'm not a fan of trinaldo i'm not gonna lie i'm not his fan but he was better he was 10 times better and uh, with your promotion this would have never happened this would have never happened uh uh this z sorry uh would you allow a draw around I mean, draw around zero zero one one, and uh, would you allow this, or you would say, listen, it has to be one zero or zero one. In today's MMA rules, I don't think they allow it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, point of deduction. What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Agree. Would you abduct points or you would uh, penalize fighters in another way? Hmm. I like these ideas. Definitely we do. Yeah. About uh, point abduction, hmm. this point abduction system, I mean, it's okay, but one point deduction for the second foul always. Uh, second foul is what? I mean, uh, second nut shot or second nard ball or... Yeah, I don't like it too. Intentional and unintentional, the, the referee can do whatever he wants, yes. If it's intentional and unintentional, he can do whatever he wants. And uh, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, more penalty systems, yeah. Second foul always. Yeah, for me, it's, it's kind of harsh to believe that there are intentional and unintentional fouls. I mean, I don't even know how judge scores it. How even judge thinks of Intentional and unintentional foul. Yeah, for me, okay, I mean, unintentional foul can happen, but uh, then fighters need to really worry about this. As it stands now, fighters do not care. Hector Lombard kicks shields low in the third, 100% intentional, but no point deduction. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yeah, we cannot prove. Yes, I remember Lombard versus shields, yeah. It was an intentional foul, but yeah, the judges maybe tolerate it once, and who knows? And uh, Eddie Alvarez, uh, uh, who was he fighting when it was that point abduction? Was it a knee to the head or or some elbow or? Yes, they have to be careful. I'm trying to remember to remember which Eddie rules. Uh, Eddie Alvarez about while he was in the UFC, one bout was ruled no contest. I can't remember, was it a knee or I'm trying to remember which fight that was, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe it was that fight. I'm unsure. I'm trying to remember now, I'm sure, but I know no one fight was ruled no contest. Yeah, because of that kind of unintentional foul, and this is something I don't know. You would also have uh, such uh, such problem because what if uh, if un if an unintentional foul happens? All right, you said you don't like the word intentional. All right, 
If an unintentional foul happens and the other fighter cannot continue, what would you do? It would be a very, very harsh to define. But for example, you know the foul was unintentional, but uh, you know, but the other fighter is unable to continue. So what would you do? For example, he go, he runs forward and the guy counters with a spinning back kick and it's an hard shot. He can't continue. So how would you how would you rule the battle? How would you rule the bout then? Yeah, I know. I know in MMA, in UFC, sometimes it's no contest, sometimes it's disqualification, sometimes it's it's you know there is commissions and uh, and the fighters are complaining, their managers are complaining, everybody's complaining, and if there is a clean rule, you can't complain. But for example, in Taekwondo, for example. You can run towards the opponent and he can try to counter you and unintentionally hit you with an arch shot. I mean, it can happen. It rarely happens, but it can. So, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the first foul, there was no warnings. Yeah. Maybe it was not intentional. I don't know, but he was. the point was abducted. It was just up to the ref. Yes, it is. It's basically up to the ref. It is always up to the ref. Now, in the MMA, they are given two. They are given uh, too big, uh, too big ability for the referee to decide. That is okay, but I don't like sometimes point, sometimes no point. Well, I don't like it either. I mean, second foul, fine. If it's second foul, fine, no problem. But the first foul would have to be something really, really intentional. And you know, I would give one thing on that. Faking, simulating, point abduction immediately. For example, he didn't kneel to the face and you just simulate point abduction immediately. For example, for me, this is point abduction immediately. You are making us all fools. You know, the ref has to deem the intent. They cannot do this. Well, yeah. I would only I would only abduct the point immediately for simulation, you know. For example, you say, yeah, he hit me, but he did, you go to the replay and he didn't touch you. Fine, man. I mean, unfair. <laughs> Koscheck versus Rumble. <laughs> that Josh Koscheck is one of the biggest fakers ever. Also Koscheck versus Daly, the biggest faker in the history of this sport and you know daily sucker punched him but he deserved it he definitely deserved it yeah he was he was such a faker i if you try to cheat the point system i agree take a point for faking yes and sometimes if you try to fake for the second time uh, you can even abduct two points because you're not a knight then you're you're not a knight you're a champ why did you enter the octagon if you don't want to fight then leave it then tap out surrender I mean, you're not a knight then. All right, you can't continue. Nobody's going to kill you for that. But don't cheat. It's not okay. Yeah, cheating is not okay. I mean, there are cameras. There are... You can't cheat in front of the cameras, right? I mean, in the early days of UFC, if, if the ref doesn't see it, fine. But today, we have... We have... I mean, there are so many high-quality cameras. There are so many lovely high-quality cameras. And replay can go 10 times if needed. Replay can go even 20 times. And cheating is so, so unfair. This is a sport. I mean, you're not in the street. This is a sport with rules, regulations. And yeah, this... I mean, your idea is very good. I I think even your promotion... Nobody has, has such an idea. Uh, listen, I've talked to many guys, to many... Even Ido Pariente, he has some... Uh, he has some promotion... In Israel, some which is amateur promotion, he was thinking of something similar, but rules are basically MMA. Yeah, to see. I wish they could use the replay to decide what happened to, and then maybe restart restart the fight. Why is there a rule that if they use the replay, then the fight cannot be restarted? Hmm. You know, I wasn't thinking about this, and uh, hmm. I know for that rule, but. I don't know. I don't know how to answer it because uh, I also think this rule makes no sense to me, at least. Just like, uh, 
just like that 12 to 6 rules rule has some modifications because it really has to be 90 degrees because this and this is allowed and um, it's kind of stupid i should start my own promotion on native reserve here in canada so that i can make my own rules <clears throat> why not man if you can find sponsor listen You'll probably think that I'm just, um, I, I mean, I don't know him. I don't know you in person. I'll tell you honestly, but um, I think your idea is good if you can find a sponsor. Why not, man? Why not? There is no promotion in the world that has such rules. Really, you would be the first one with such rules. And if you're able to, you know, to draw the attention of some, how to say, to draw the attention of someone who really appreciates your hard efforts, why not? Why not, man? It's a good idea. I mean, I, uh, which state in Canada? Which is your state? Of course. Ontario? Well, it's even better. In Canada, I don't know a good fighter from, from Ontario state. I mean, I know George St. Pierre, Rory McDonald, and such guys, but I don't know which one is, if there is a good from Ontario, but... Yeah, but Ontario is very close to those lakes, and why not? Why not? It's a superb idea. I know if it goes. Uh, VAR video assistant was meant to solve the unclear moments in football soccer, but just made more confusion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In soccer, yes. I'm a soccer referee, and we have that video assistant referee, and yeah, it creates many confusions, because when you return the situation, you don't know whether he tackled to the leg or... Uh, whether he tackled to the leg or whether he tackled to the foot. And when he tackles to the leg, it's a red card. When he tackles to the foot, it's a yellow card. And and maybe it's not even a foul. Kyle Nelson is from very close to me. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. All right. I mean, I don't know each state separately, but yeah, why not? I mean, with the assistant referee kind of made a lot of confusions because sometimes you return and... Soccer rules are very are changed very often, and this is the reason why why we referees, for example, must uh, update our knowledge all the time. Sometimes you simply have to go forward. Sometimes, uh, sometimes even the referee doesn't know whether it was an offense or not. Yes, but yeah, in soccer, yes, in soccer, with assistant referee made a lot of confusions luckily i'm not on the league when where there is a video assistant referee but yeah sometimes you return the video and you don't know you don't know you don't know oh yeah thank you thank you a lot z thank you so much and please don't give up your dreams try to find sponsors try to fight try to try to find something for your own promotion listen i'm supporting you 100 percent i believe kendall does it too and yeah I'm also thinking of checking out because it's kind of getting late. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, I will. I will keep. Well, yeah, I'm refing semi professional matches. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's kind of county league. How do you say it? Is it a county league? How do you say it? You know, big city and uh, something around big city. Do you say it a county league or? Huh. Uh, yeah, I I released a video. I released a video for betting predictions for Connor and Cowboy. You have it on my channel. Yeah, I released a video. You have it. Yeah, check it on my channel. Uh, I released a video from the main card. And uh, listen, if uh, if I have it live on Fight Channel, why not? I will, I will broadcast live. I mean, I don't know yet. I know maybe two or three days earlier, but I will broadcast it live. I will always broadcast live from now on whenever I have it because, you know, I'm, I'm too big fan of this sport. I love this sport too much. When I don't have it, I go for short recaps. But when I have it, man, I must comment. I love, I love this sport so much. I mean, this is the best sport I've ever seen. I mean, since the first event, I was like, I was a five-year-old kid, you know, and uh, my father was, hey, we saw UFC and so on. And he showed me the tape. He said, this is not for kids. I said, fine. And I was like, and I was like, uh, you know, when I saw that, I was like a five-year-old kid. And I was like, 
I was like this. My father was, what the hell are you doing? Are you insane? I was like, I was like this, you know, big eyes. Uh, uh, yeah, Alexei Alenik fights Morris Green. Yeah, I released the video. I said what I think uh, on that fight. And yeah, I released that video. I also hope Alexei Alenik is going to win. If Alexei takes him down, I think Morris Green has no chances. But uh, it will... It will be hard to take him down. He's always around number 14, 15. He's he's not an average fighter. You can't be a ranked guy, a ranked guy if you're if you're um, how to say if you're an average fighter. On the other side, Alexei Olenek, Black Constrictor. He has more than 60 matches and he's a fantastic guy. He's just all right. He lost Alistair over him because almost it's almost impossible to choke out to choke out Alistair over him. I mean, Alistair over him has good submission experience. Yes, he's constantly up there. The other side over him. He's a very experienced guy. Morris Green, hmm. you know, compared to Olenik, his uh, level of experience is questionable. I've got to say, Olenik... Olenik needs to take the fight to the ground. Will he be able to or not? You know, he survived two very, very big knockouts. Hmm. I just hope he can recover, he can bounce back, but... I don't know how the philosophy of a fighter changes when he survives a knockout. I know if you watch the match between Rafael Fiziev and Magomed Magomedov, I think Fiziev survived a very, very hard knockout via spinning back kick to the head, but he bounced back with a decision win over, I think, Alex White, or I think it's Alex White. But I hear one guy who follows my channel and uh, who is from, who is from um, Kyrgyzstan, and he, he asked me about physio. I said, listen, he, he's bouncing back from a very, very tough defeat. And he bounced back with the decision win. Give him one more fight, then we can predict. And yeah, I believe if Olenek wins, he can bounce back. Will he be able to take Morris Green down? Well, that's a question. That's a question to think. That's, that's something we need to think about a lot. And for the good... I believe he will, but will he? We don't know until the match kicks off. Yeah, Alexei Olenik. Hmm. I think he is the best Ukrainian fighter, Ukrainian origin fighter, Ukrainian born. And yeah, generally, <clears throat> I like uh, I like um, the idea of uh, of your spending a lot of time on Wikipedia, and uh, this is good, you know, because this sport. This part can't progress without people that are fully dedicated to it. For example, when I was working, I mean, I had good experiences with everybody I worked for, but there are too many limits, and this is something I definitely don't like. There are too many unnecessary rules, and why not? I'm just a guy who wants to exchange thoughts with everybody. I mean, even a good critic is a good critic. Why not? This is sport. We are here to progress. We are here to go forward, to go high, to... I mean, even the most stupid criticism can lead to a superb idea. The way, you, the way we saw with Z, why not? Creating your own promotion with the different rules is a good, is a good to kick off, a good start, a good way to start. Why not? Generally, I'm pretty much thrilled for this conversation. Thank you so much, guys. I've enjoyed it about great martial arts. Yeah, I hope. I hope we saw which one could be the best. Yeah, Lenik has a crazy reach. Very useful for wrapping up Green in his game. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kendall. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you for this lovely knowledge and lovely session. See you all next time. I will see when I will go live next time because uh, I'm unsure which would be the date, but I will talk uh, specifically on this UFC 246 fight card. And of course, I will answer the questions. We can always go in different direction. One day next week, I'll see which one. I'll film a video and I'll let you know on my channel uh, which one. And thank you so much. I will announce which day and we will chat again. Have it all. Have you all a great day. Thank you so much.